As I mentioned a couple times already, tomorrow is the first day of a new school year here in Lee County Public Schools. Households will be bustling as for the first time in months, families try to figure out how to get parents and kids and all their gear for both of them out the door at the same time. And yet somehow in the middle of all that chaos, some parents will find time to post, pin, or tweet pictures of the kids going off to school or some wait till post the ones of mom's celebration of the empty house after they leave. Some will also take to Twitter to send their kids encouraging messages and sharing how proud they are of their children and all that they have accomplished and all they may accomplish in this coming year. Many of these same parents and even grandparents took to Twitter last summer as the school year ended to share their congratulations and they, how proud they were of their children's closing year grades. Most of them were probably along the line of this one that I saw last week from a parent whose child goes to school in Britain, which just recently finished its final exams. My wife and I are proud of our daughter getting six A pluses and four A's. But I doubt that many of the tweets that were sent in June by those proud parents had their tweet shared almost 100,000 times as this parent's was. And I doubt that it made the headlines of the BBC. For the proud parent tweeting his daughter's grave, if you didn't know already, is Zadine Yusufazi, father of Malala Yusufaza. She is the 2015 Nobel Peace Prize winner at age 18, no pressure. No pressure, Henry. <laughs> she won the prize for her efforts as an international activist for girls' rights in education, all while continuing her studies and living as normal as life as an 18-year-old girl as she can. She even talks in her Nobel Prize-winning speech about how she preaches peace, but she hasn't quite learned how to live that with her two younger brothers. Now, Malala started speaking out when she was young. She grew up in the Swat Valley of Pakistan and attended a girls' school founded by her activist father. After the Taliban took over the valley and bad girls' education, she gave a speech entitled, How Dare the Taliban Take Away My Basic Right to Education. She was all of 11 at the time. The BBC then invited her to start blogging anonymously, sharing what it meant to live as a young girl under the Taliban. However, a few months later, she was revealed as the BBC blogger and became a target of the Taliban's attacks. She also won the Pakistan National Youth Peace Prize that year. Malala started to make international headlines when at age 14, she was shot along with two of her other classmates by a Taliban gunman as the girls were heading off to school. She gained that international attention when she was brought to England to be treated for her injuries. And so after she's recovered, invitations started coming in to her to speak about her efforts and what was going on there. Soon the young girl was speaking at the UN meeting with world leaders, and letting her voice become the voice of 66 million girls deprived of even the opportunity to attend school. She does this even though the Taliban continues to target her and her family and make it impossible for them to return to her native Pakistan. But her family stands firmly behind what she believes and encourages her to use her voice. And all the while she does this, she is very clear that this is not about her and that she is not the only girl facing these challenges or even standing up to them. She's just the most visible at the moment. And so she speaks up for those who aren't being heard. Our scripture passages today tell of Joshua and the author of Ephesians 
as they urged their communities to stand firm and speak up. Joshua was at the edge of the promised land, ready to enter with the Hebrew people for the first time after their 40 years of exodus, after they fled from slavery in Egypt. Before they enter this new land, which has people there already with their customs and their own gods, he asked the Hebrew people one more time to choose, choose who they will serve. Yahweh, the God who has traveled with them through these years, the God who has freed them from slavery, or the gods of this new land. He asked them then to declare publicly their foundational values, those that, of the God that they have been following, or of the new land that they will be entering, and then stand firm within them. Then in our passage from Ephesians, the author urges early Christians to stand firm, to trust in God's love and righteousness when faced with opposition and persecution. But as they stand firm, he urges them to do so in the same spirit that God shows, the same spirit that Jesus modeled, one of love and peace. He reflects this as he reframes the militaristic Roman armor of attack and violence into one constructed of God's ways of love and justice. He urges the Ephesians to surround themselves with this new way of life so that they can stand firm against the violent, self-interested powers and narratives of the world. Earlier in the letter, he urges them to speak with truth against those same powers and forces, and to do so in love. If they immerse themselves in this new life, surround themselves with this armor of God, he promises them they will be able to stand firm, as the author has learned to do himself. I first saw Malala when she appeared on The Daily Show about a year before she won the Nobel Peace Prize. Host John Stewart was clearly charmed by and awed by her, at, the, at then 16 year old. I still look at that and say, 16? What was I doing at 16? <laughs> but he, I think he had the same thought because she won him over quickly. And if you had any doubt about that, it was after he asked her what it was like when she found out that the Taliban was actually targeting her, at that time a 12-year-old girl, for her speaking up. She talked about how the family at first dismissed it, thinking they would never target a girl. Her father, yes, who was also a very outspoken activist for girls' education, but not her. And then she shared with John her eternal di internal dialogue from that time. I started thinking about that, and I used to think that the Talib, that's what she calls the Taliban, would come and he would just kill me. But then I said, if he comes, what would you do, Malala? Then I would reply myself, that Malala take a shoe and hit him. But then I said, if you hit a Talib with your shoe, then there would be no difference between you and the Talib. You must not treat others that much with cruelty and that much harshly. You must fight others, but through peace and through dialogue and through education. Then I said, I'll tell them how important education is and that I even want education for your children as well. And I will tell him, that's what I want to tell you. Now, do what you want. Looking at the 16-year-old girl, John Stewart was visibly stunned. And turning to her, he humbly said, let me ask you, you know, I know your father is backstage and he's very proud of you. But would he be bad if I adopted you? <laughs> because you sure are swell. And watching it, I wanted to say, me too. 
How Mala describes facing a Talibib echoes the same spirit of the armor of God in Ephesians. It isn't an armor of attack, of going on the offensive and forcing others to do what you believe is right. It isn't even an armor designed to match with the same defensive force of any attack that you might receive, inflicting harm in self-defense. It is an armor that allows one to stand firm, but without being stubborn or obstinate. It is an armor that grounds one in humility. It opens discussion and debate, but listening to others involved in the dialogue, instead of using those weapons of verbal bars and demonizing attacks that we so often resort to. It's an armor that uses God's love and ways to struggle for justice and peace and reconciliation, to struggle with the powers of the world and within ourselves, but to do so so that we are still open to being wrong, to discerning and growing as we stay firm in a few basic faith values. It's what allows us to speak up to be a voice for those who are voiceless is what allows us, like the writer of Ephesians, to speak and make known the boldness of God's word of grace and healing for all in creation. As Malala shows, this is true for people no matter how old they are or young they are. And that includes those on the other end of the age spectrum. Just ask the women of the Raging Grannies. The Raging Grannies began in 1987 in Victoria, British Columbia, and quickly spread across Canada and now in countries worldwide. Initially, these older women joined in local peace and environmental movements, but they were relegated to making coffee, and they found little openness to their ideas. So frustrated, these women decided they would begin speaking up in their own way. Some of the women had been lifelong activists, but some had come to it at this stage in their life. So dressing as parodies of the stereotypes of older women, you know, sensible shoes, dowdy clothes, hats and all that, they began using humor and satire in order to be heard by those in power. One year, they tried to go over the barricade at the Canadian Prime Minister's residence in an attempt to deliver lumps of coal in his stocking for Christmas. Another year, they slithered down the street in a giant earthworm costume to mark Earth Day. They continually find ways to speak up that are true to themselves. Malala was on The Daily Show again this year, this past June. Coincidentally, it was the day after the attacks at Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, that had killed Reverend Clementa Pickney and eight members of his congregation. Stewart had opened the show that time saying that he had nothing, nothing funny to say that night. It was all gone. And then he followed it with a monologue that alternated between lamenting and blistering about how, again, it was a day after the, a horrific attack in this nation, and that he feared that, as in the past, probably after the initial shock wore off, nothing of real value would be done to address or change it. He told no jokes that night. As he introduced Malala, he was grateful for her stance of being there and acknowledged that she had experienced the horrors of humanity that no one her age should ever have had to face. So John asked her how she felt after hearing about this attack in Charleston. What was her take on humanity and our capacity to change? After affirming her belief that the vast majority of people are good and want things for others, she spoke of why it sometimes seems as if that isn't the case. Sometimes we wait for others 
and think that Martin Luther should rise up among us and Nelson Mandela should rise among us and speak up for us. But we never realize that they are normal human beings like us. And if we step forward, we can also bring change just like them. Are we waiting for others to step forward? Are we hoping that someone will step forward and speak up? Speak up for those who face violence, discrimination, poverty, or oppression? Or if we do get the courage to speak up, do we do so only by surrounding ourselves in an armor of ideology that is so impenetrable that any opportunities for thoughtful discussions, discernment, or solutions just bounce right off? We can wait for others, or we can surround ourselves with God's abiding presence that will allow us to speak up for whatever it is that tugs at our hearts and spirits with despair. So those times when we have nothing in the face of injustice or pain. We can hope a Martin Luther or Nelson Mandela or Malala is raised up. Or we can speak up, knowing that God has a word that leads to true justice, true peace, and true reconciliation, and that it is possible for us to live that out. If an 11-year-old Pakistani girl and a group of Canadian grannies can do this, surely we can. Amen. For those of you who aren't aware, John and I are both what you call a lectionary preacher. We preach off a three-year schedule of scripture passages that are provided to the wider church. And we alternate. I preach about every four weeks, usually. And so how we determine what we're preaching on is he gives me the dates I'm preaching on. And we both go off into our separate corners. And we figure out what we're going to preach, and we come back. It's very rare that we coordinate. We have talked in the past, though, about doing a sermon series, one where one of us on one Sunday expresses one point of view about something, and one the next week a different point of view, so that we could model how good people of faith can be in disagreement and have discussion. We haven't done that yet, but I had to laugh when I got back the schedule and it had the last two for August. My sermon today was entitled, Speak Up. Next week, you're going to hear from him, quick to listen, slow to speak. <laughs> now, in some ways, that fits both your pastor's personalities, but I do suspect that what he will be emphasizing, and I haven't asked him what it was, is more of the love, more of that we must speak up, but we speak in love and we have to listen to others. So this week, I want to urge you to go out there and speak up. Speak up for those things, those places, those people who tug at your heart who you feel there is something fundamentally wrong with the way they are being treated. Have the courage to speak up. And then when you come back next week, if you haven't done it with love, he'll probably correct you on that. May God bless you and keep you until we all meet again.